Terrific. So welcome. My name is Colette Temink and I'm president of property services at Eden. And I also have the pleasure of serving on the IFMA board. So thank you all for attending today's Built Environment Technology Alliance, also known as BETA. BETA was started by a team of industry thought leaders to, to really um, help innovators and across technology really and the built environment come together to design what tomorrow will look like for the places that we live, work, and play. And we appreciate um, your participation as we engage in a thoughtful conversation on the short and long-term impacts of COVID-19. You know, how are leading service providers approaching service delivery and technology utilization with an esteemed panel of industry experts? So before we start, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Cushman and Wakefield, um, and the IFMA information technology community for the foresight to appreciate the importance of engaging leaders in a dialogue to help shape and accelerate the advances in the built environment. And we'd also like to thank the panelists and the firms that they represent for also appreciating the importance of this dialogue, especially in today's environment when much of the world's population is asking and wondering, you know, what changes will take place in the workplace of the future and how we support and maintain the built environment going forward. So please note your audio has been muted for audio quality. We are recording today's event for future reference and distribution. And time permitting, we will have a Q&A session at the end. So feel free to submit your questions in the chat box. Just hit chat, submit your question. Um, and we will be monitoring the chat um, for themes for questions at the end. Also, on behalf of the panelists and myself, we would really like to thank the essential workers and the individuals that support the built and physical environments. They are heroes working overtime to keep us safe. So at this time, I would like to introduce a moderator, Ingrid Fenn. Ingrid is a highly accomplished entrepreneur and leading innovator in corporate real estate and facilities management. As CEO and president of Sirius, she provides strategic advisory services to some of the world's most admired companies. She and her organization have expertise ranging from solution design to portfolio and vendor management. And Sirius develops integrated solutions for um, and strategies to reduce costs, portfolio management, workplace optimization, talent retention, outsourcing, vendor and supplier decisions and governance. Ingrid is also a frequent speaker at conferences and events and has published numerous articles in various industry and trade journals and publications. So thank you, Ingrid, for joining. I'm gonna turn it over to you at this time. Thank you, Colette. I'm really excited for this discussion and uh, honored to introduce such an esteemed panel of industry experts who are gonna share their thoughts and perspectives with us over the next hour. Um, and you know, given such it's such an unprecedented time in our history, I think this will be a very unique opportunity to hear what the impacts will likely be on our industry in the future. So with that, I'm pleased to welcome uh, Chandra Gondapandi, who Chandra was recently promoted to Chief Administrative Officer at CBRE. So congratulations, Chandra. She is responsible for CBRE's digital and technology, people marketing and research or organizations. Ms. Dondapani joined CBRE in 2016 to lead the company's digital tech, uh, strategy in all aspects of the technology globally. Uh, before joining CBRE, Chandra spent 17 years at Capital One in a number of leadership positions, including digital transformation, technology, marketing and um, operations in consumer lending. So welcome Chandra. I'd also like to welcome Bill Knightley. Bill has also recently moved into the chief executive role of Global Occupier Services for Cushman and Wakefield. So congratulations, Bill. 
Bill has nearly 20 years of a global experience across multiple industries, including global FP&A uh, lead for GE Transportation. Bill leads CNW's service line focused on the world's largest occupiers. These services include portfolio management, transaction management and project and facilities management for many of the world's leading corporations. During his tenure at CNW, Bill has held a number of leadership positions, including COO of GOS, EVP of Investor Relations and Treasurer, and Global Head of FP&A. So welcome, Bill. I'd also like to welcome Scott Nelson. Scott Nelson is CEO, Occupier Services Globally at Colliers International, and is responsible for strategy and leadership of the Occupier Services business unit. Occupier Services makes up the platform of tools and talent that supports leading occupier client relationships, including tenant representation and project management assignments, multi-market accounts, and corporate solutions outsourcing engagements. Occupier Services is organized globally under Scott's leadership with robust platforms and major client engagements based in all regions of Americas, EMEA, and APAC. Scott has also held key leadership positions for much of his career with his entire tenure focused on occupier clients and the development of businesses and platforms to serve these clients, including experience directly leading client engagements with some of the most recognized global brands. Pleased to have you, Scott. And last but not least, I'd like to welcome Sanjay Rishi. Sanjay is the America's CEO, Corporate Solutions for JLL. At JLL, Sanjay leads the America's team dedicated to helping clients create, shape, and manage the future of work by enhancing the performance of their workspaces, real estate portfolios, and people. Sanjay joined JLL in 2018 from IBM, where he ran the cloud consulting services business. Prior to that, he was Chief Information Officer and Global Vice President of Strategic Planning for Johnson & Controls Automotive. He has also held roles as a partner for PwC and Vice President of IBM Global Strategy. So welcome, Sandra. Okay. So with that, um, we'll get into some questions of this, of this team. So uh, why don't we start with you, Scott? Are you anticipating an acceleration of digital transformation in your organization uh, or your clients' organizations or both? Thanks, Ingrid. And uh, I want to say first thank you to IFMA, Colette as well, and the team at IFMA. Uh, I hope everybody is doing well and staying safe in this really challenging time we're all in. Uh, but thanks for tuning in today. So. Regarding acceleration of digital transformation within our organization or, or our client's organization, our answer certainly would be both uh, for us. And, you know, we certainly see a perfect storm happening right now. Um, companies are forced to be doing more with less people. Uh, companies are actually forced to pivot, uh, even innovate and even in disrupt. Uh, the, the industry in some ways or disrupt their business model in some ways, uh, which presents really interesting opportunities. A big thing that we all uh, face over time is change management when it comes to digital transformation, of course. And we've really seen, I think we've all seen that change management barriers have been reduced. If you certainly, if you speak also with our technology and strategy leaders within the business, um, the, the adoption, the challenge also always with adoption really has uh, in many cases uh, been lessened and and uh, our, our people are, are being forced to adopt uh, new ways of working, which has been really great. Uh, there have been some great outcomes as a result of that. And then uh, stating the obvious, you know, there's been a lack of face-to-face -face interaction, as we all know, and, um, and so the opportunity to interact, to plan, process digitally now really uh, is, again, a part of that whole opportunity that's in front of us. Uh, further, as we all have seen, you know, the, research, the research is out there and compelling that companies, that have, got, companies have taken on, that have taken on the challenge in times like this in the past the companies that have really been innovative and forward and making fast decisions, 
pivoting uh, over time have demonstrated that they've either accelerated their lead or become leaders within their space. And so I think there's a lot of data behind uh, the opportunity for digital transformation, again, with us and our clients. So a few additional comments. Um, we have been uh, sponsoring a PropTech accelerator now for several years and uh, have really seen some good results among the classes of companies that um, that we've been sponsoring and we we certainly are bullish on the future there but with, even with all the prop tech activity in our industry there there's also a lot of noise i think we would all agree there there are so many startups that uh, can be perceived to do even the same thing or very close to the same thing and what's the what's the value proposition there there is quite a bit of technology that um, that we see in order to really be successful, it, it will need to be chosen as the one platform that everybody in the industry or the majority of the industry chooses, which to, to us certainly seems risky and we're not sure that there will be just one winner. We believe there probably will be a few winners longer term, but um, to, to leading us to the kind of the punchline here, for, for us, we see the flexibility, the speed, uh, the, the ability to act fast, the, the opportunity for choice when it comes to technology platforms, the opportunity to be able to accommodate all kinds of different situations, different, uh, different companies in different parts of their maturity and, and using different technology, some not using as much technology, that will really be important. Uh, so digital transformation overall that really gives gives users, gives companies options, we believe is is the future. And an example of that might be transaction management technology. So uh, we we certainly are believers that a lot of uh, a lot of a transaction will be done digitally in the future. But again, diversity is going to be very important. And so as as an example, uh, we can't design a technology solution and a platform that's only successful if it's if it's done in a large market, large major market around the world where there's tons of data and transparency. Because as we all know, we and our clients are operating in in small markets in many cases, in opaque markets in many many cases, and so the opportunity opportunity for technology to really take that into account and not just only work when all the answers are in a database. Uh, also, we we've certainly believe the technology has to be able to accommodate an expert advisory team and um, <clears throat> the client to be able to work with it without extensive training, without, you know, coming a, a, a group of stakeholders being able to come together that haven't worked together before and utilize that technology in an efficient way, which, which is certainly a challenge. And you know, we, we see the value proposition with the advisory, again, on transaction advisory, there's, there's gonna be more and more of the value proposition around the ability to lead a team, to, to be a program manager, lead a team of diverse experts from within your company stakeholders within the client organization, uh, third parties, et cetera. So that flexibility um, within the dis digital transformation, we believe is, is front and center. And so we don't really see the, the boiling the ocean strategy is, is going to be successful. Great, thank you so much, Scott. Chandra, how, do you, how is CBRE thinking about uh, digital transformation and, and the impacts of COVID and how, you, how you're approaching technology in the future? Sure, and great. First of all, great to be uh, here. And it's not often that the four companies that compete with each other on a daily basis are all together on a panel. And it's also great to see in the chat room participants from pretty much around the world. Uh, so great to be with all of you. In terms of, um, first, let me start with how we define digital transformation. And uh, digital transformation, uh, as I define it, is really the reimagining of products and services that a company provides using a blend of human and technology capabilities. And uh, second thing is reimagining the way we work and make sure that you know we bust our silos and become much more multifunctional. And third, leveraging the power of data in a more meaningful way. With that definition, um, you know I see an acceleration of digital transformation happening in our industry in three ways. 
and um, and that's applicable at CBRE as well. So there are things first. There are things that every company has to still get done, whether or not we are in the offices. And that is, we have to figure out how to stay connected with clients. We have to hire and onboard employees, manage our financial processes. The list goes on, right? So we have to get used to doing things more digitally, just to keep doing things that we have to do every day. The second, most companies are facing a near-term decline in revenue, so there's intense cost pressure. And automation is a great way to systemically lower cost of services as well as OpEx. And number three, with a highly uncertain future, data is even more important. I talk about data a lot typically, but in today's environment, it's even more important both to read and react and to predict. Overall, though, um, I would say we see an acceleration of trends that are already underway versus predominantly any new trends that um, are popping up. And um, you know, as Scott mentioned, um, CBRE obviously we also have investments in various VC funds around the world, and we um, carefully uh, watch and work with startups, hundreds of them around the world, to see what innovation is um, emerging in our industry. And I would say again, during this pandemic, we have simply seen an acceleration of existing trends rather than any predominantly new trends. The overarching theme is how do we better and more elegantly collect, connect people, places, and things, especially in the built environment. A uh, couple of other thoughts, I would say, um, at the end of the day, it's important to keep in mind that successful digital transformation is so much more about people and culture rather than technology itself. And I would also say, in an environment like this, in, as in any recession, we are expecting that technology investments and usage will be uh, looked at in a much more utilitarian, cost-effective, commercially viable way, rather than chasing shiny objects. Scott referred to as not boiling the ocean. And um, you know, I refer to it as, let's not chase shiny objects. Let's really provide meaningful technology capabilities that help our clients and help our employees do their uh, jobs better. So with that, Ingrid, I'll turn back to you. Thank you, Chandra. I think that many clients would welcome that. Um, so Sanjay, what is one thing that you've learned um, about your organization from what's been happening with COVID um, in the last six months? Well, thank you for that, Ingrid, and thank you and Colette and Data and Efma. Great to be here with all uh, all my partners uh, and having this conversation. Boy, learning. Have we learned a lot over the last three months, uh, four months? Uh, but let me just, uh, maybe if I had to pick two words, I would say maybe resilience and empathy. And it's really, uh, it applies to our organization, JLL, as well as our client organizations. But let me just start with JLL. And, you know, I've been here about two years now, and I've had the privilege of working at some leading organizations. And I always thought there was just something very, very special about the JLL culture. Uh, but the extent and the speed with which our teams have come together, along with our, our, our clients, in just trying to solve these entirely new challenges, unprecedented challenges. I mean, we cr uh, created, curated more than 30 new products. We implemented them at our clients just a matter of, of a few weeks. So just the speed and the extent of, of this resilience, uh, products around health, well-being, sustainability, I mean, look at things that we've done in this industry forever, uh, transitions. So we've collaborated with our, our clients uh, in transitioning new accounts remotely. It's completely unprecedented. And then if I pick on empathy, Ingrid, a bit, uh, this has been quite the learning. It's been very humbling, I think, to see our teams and how they have stepped up within their communities and at work um, and just making sure that they're going, and no different than anyone on this webinar, we've had teams going from day one uh, to our clients delivering services and putting their lives, their health at risk, their family's health at risk. I mean, if that's not humbling, I don't know what is. And by the way, there's so many stories uh, as, uh, and I've been talking to a lot of our people, cross-section of our folks, and it's really, uh, I keep using the word humbling because it truly is, they're going back to back home many of them to their spouses uh, who are firefighters and policemen and women and paramedics and doctors and nurses. So, I mean, this has been the learning about the organization, the culture, 
and this again, I go back to resilience and empathy are the two words I, I sort of uh, rally around in terms of learnings, Ingrid. Thank you, Sanjay. Thanks. Um, Bill, your thoughts on, on what you've learned at Cushman throughout this time? Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Ingrid. And I, I guess first, I just want to echo the, the comments my colleagues have made in terms of uh, being here, collaborating together. Um, so thank you for having us. We, we've thought and taken the position from the beginning of this, this, this is a, a health crisis above all. And, and so um, I think it's really powerful that all of us, you know, competitors here can be together and, and collaborate because at the end of the day, what, what we want to make sure is that we're sharing all the best learnings to try to keep people safe and healthy. So I think it's great to be here with all of you today. Um, I would absolutely echo what, what Sanjay just said. Um, I think empathy is, is a key word right now. I, I think you could take that um, far more broadly to some of the societal issues that we're dealing with beyond the COVID experience. And I'm sure we'll get to that later in the panel. Um, but I think the thing I'm most proud of right now is, is our client facing teams. And Sanjay talked about this a little bit, Colette, in her open, opening remarks. Uh, it's truly amazing that the work that our essential workers have done, our, our client facing folks, um, in many cases, risking lives to do so, operating in a hospital environment or other medical environment. Um, so it's 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 really remarkable, and that that's for all the service providers, obviously. Um, the thing I've learned the most about our organization is how how agile we could be when when the environment demanded it. And I think Sanjay was alluding to that with with some of his remarks. Um, for Cushman, it's it's a little unique in that we've really been on this journey for about five years. Of, of course, Cushman and Wakefield is a hundred year old brand and it's been around forever and ever, but. We started with a series of mergers back in 2014, so we're, we're still relatively new in our current state. And without a doubt, I saw a new level of collaboration and, and productivity um, that I haven't seen in, in my six years at Cushman and Wakefield. Uh, you know, we use the phrase, never let a good crisis go to waste. And there's no doubt in my mind that our firm has fundamentally come together in a different way. And, um, quite honestly, I'm optimistic that we've transformed the company and, and how we uh, collaborate and interact across geographies, across service lines. I, I think in our industries, we know that that's a challenge for us sometimes, just given the inherent local nature of real estate. And so um, with us, it's it's actually been about six months because we, we started this process uh, with a very large JV in China with Banca Services. And um, by the time we were really getting serious about closing offices, in the United States, um, you know, we had already probably brought back a million folks across 800 million square feet in China. So we had a good baseline having that joint venture and the way the teams came together and the experts around the world to take that content, um, translate it, um, obviously not just in language, but to the different jurisdictions all around the world and get it to the hands of these multinational clients that are operating in complex environments in many different jurisdictions. Um, it, the speed at which that happened and the collaboration across geographies uh, was just incredible to me. So I'm, I'm really proud of, of all of our professionals for that. Great. Thanks so much, Bill. Um, Scott, can you talk to us a little bit about uh, how you think real estate services, whether it's transactions, projects, or facilities, is going to change the way you guys think about delivering them at Collier's um, post the pandemic? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Ingrid. So um, really not even just Collier's, but uh, across the industry, I'm certainly hopeful that it changes a lot and even more now that we've been through this experience or going through this experience. I know a lot of us view that uh, our industry has been a little slower to innovate and and uh, and, and adapt and, and even disrupt. And so uh, as mentioned, m many have mentioned already, I think there's big opportunity for the future. So I'd, I'd probably make maybe three points to, to answer the question on uh, what changes we would see. And the first is digital transformation. Uh, the second is leveraging virtual interaction and less travel. And the third is uh, the partnership or service provider models that occupiers are, are choosing going forward. So digital transformation, are, are, we already addressed that earlier. Uh, the second one, virtual interaction and less travel. Um, of course, that's what we're all dealing with today, but we certainly believe that that's sustainable and, and that can be really long-term. 
Um, again, our industry has been slower to innovate, so sometimes we need uh, we need a nudge or a little more than a nudge. But um, this this shift towards digital interaction was was already underway, or, or uh, the the ability to get things done digitally was already underway. But we certainly believe that that'll accelerate. So you know, for us, we we absolutely believe culture, personal relationships, teamwork is, is critical. That's our that that's something we really believe is is our our place in the industry. But uh, some travel is not worth the loss of productivity. Probably, I think everybody looking back would would see that maybe now more than ever. So uh, as an example, I mean, they, in our industry, you know, the construction meetings, the market tours, uh, not that these will stop in person, but um, there's all kinds of opportunities for efficiency gains. There's actually even, we see opportunities for uh, quality improvements, consistency digitally. Um, that may be a little bit un, un, of an unusual theory that uh, by actually not, uh, not walking an asset with your your own two feet every every couple of weeks or whatever may actually there there could be improvements beyond uh, just just lost productivity from travel, but actually increases in quality and consistency through the use of more digital methods and and um, and that digital transformation. So we're really uh, we're really seeing opportunity there, and I think I think a lot of people are across the industry. And then lastly, the, the service, as I mentioned, the partnership and service provider models. So um, the trend, as we all know, for a long time has been uh, the, the clients, occupier clients going to fewer service provider partners. Uh, and, and we all know the reasons for that, lessening complication, improving governance, of course, leveraging spend, uh, a lot of different benefits. but. We are seeing a, a more and more companies not, as a part of that aggregation, not going to one partner for everything. And so we, we know, we all also know the benefits and challenges and whether you go with one partner or multiple and, and the trade-offs that exist. But um, maybe back to the point that uh, Shonda mentioned earlier and, and a few others about even the ability for the, the four of us to come together to, together today is is kind of unusual and, and really exciting. So we appreciate that opportunity, but it, it even extends to how we operate in the future. A lot of other industries have already have already gotten there, but we envision more and more models where the the peer, the major peer providers are in coopetition, so to speak. And um, working together on behalf of a client more than they have in the past, more than we have in the past. Even some, uh, we see more and more interest and in, um, an exploration of the integrator model. So where there's an integrator actually uh, bundling those um, that that delivery from the multiple providers. But again, fewer providers for sure, for sure. So um, you know, the view is that many clients just haven't haven't seen or don't see if they haven't done it already. Don't see the value proposition of going to just one sole source for everything. But that being said, of course, we all know cases where that has worked well for a, for a specific situation. So um, so that's what I would say there. Thanks, Scott. And I think you know, in order for for that to work effectively, and, and we've seen that across the industry, the, the right technology and the ability to share technology collaboratively between competitors is really key to make that work. Right? Yeah. Sanjay, you already mentioned um, managing transitions remotely as one of the, the major changes that you've seen, and, and certainly we've seen that with the entire bidding process, right? The co corporations need, need to manage going to the market completely in a virtual way with virtual tours, et cetera. What else are you, are you seeing that you anticipate to be a longer term future changes in the way that real estate services are delivered? Yeah, Ingrid, uh, I mean, you know, uh, I'll build on what Scott said. Um, I couldn't agree with uh, you more, Scott. I sort of uh, start with experience, this idea of, uh, you know, we've all watched experience become essential across our personal lives, professional lives, this idea of hyper-personalization. I mean, if you just look at any other industry, uh, pick automotive. Uh, cars were designed for a demographic group uh, and the hyper-personalization 
uh, of automotive uh, products, cars, trucks, etc., is it has completely transformed it. And I think uh, this crisis has accelerated the drive to make experience central to everything we do in this industry, in the real estate industry. I mean, to the uh, to the extent that many of our clients are starting to rename their organizations workplace experience because it's so much more comprehensive. And experience, of course, has multiple facets. I mean, you mentioned the bidding process, uh, experience of the workforce, people as they go in and leave buildings, experience of CRE leaders. Uh, Chandra mentioned this. I mean, it's data, data, data. It's actionable data, insights for their portfolio, for their facilities. And then experience leads naturally to this idea of responsible organizations. And it encompasses, I think, every part of real estate. And again, responsibilities uh, towards, towards people, towards well-being, towards health, towards wellness. It just, you know, um, if I could uh, uh, sort of uh, call out our purpose as JLL of shaping the future of real estate for a better world, I mean, it fits in nicely with what we believe in, but I think it's across our industry and across all of us on this webinar. Um, so in, in terms of responsible organizations, so a sustainable workforce, a sustainable workplace, materials used in building, ways of managing buildings. I mean, all of these are changes that are coming that'll stay um, different energy sources, green leasing, I and mean, the list can go on. On health and wellness, uh, healthy buildings, uh, considering new designs, programs, ways of working, uh, and then looking at the portfolio holistically and using data. Again, Scott mentioned some of this, uh, best use of space. And I'd be remiss if I didn't call out one other change uh, based on uh, just recent events. I think diversity, inclusion, bringing all voices into this conversation to see our experiences reflected in the way we design, we build, we manage spaces it are all changes. Um, that are coming and here to stay. Great. Thank you so much, Sandra. So Bill, you mentioned uh, a couple of times about the importance or that you've learned so much about empathy with your employees and the value of employees. Why do you personally care about embedding uh, inclusion and belonging in your culture? And why is that so increasingly more important today? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Ingrid, for the question. I, you know, Sanjay just set up that segue quite nicely. Um, first, I, I want to I want to echo. I I agree completely with everything that Scott and Sanjay were saying, and it's it's fascinating. You know, again, we don't we don't often have a chance to to be together on panels like this, but certainly you can see there's a consensus building um, across some of the largest service providers. If I could just add one quick thing to um, the prior question. I, I think it's a, a unique time um, where the real estate conversation is is changing. Uh, if you think about uh, the real estate conversation over the years, um, maybe it gets stuck at real estate. Maybe it gets stuck at uh, a cool new headquarters build out or site selection or a, a new refresh, um, you know, every five years. And that's when the C-suite might get interested. And, um, of course, there's exceptions, but I think C-suites around the entire world now for at least the last 30 days, if not the last 100 days, have been forced to think more strategically and more critically about what is the real estate ecosystem and, and why do I have that? Um, and how does that create experience for my employees, for my customers? Um, how does it drive innovation, et cetera? So I completely agree with everything that, that Scott and Sanjay are saying. Um, Bridge that to uh, diversity, inclusion, uh, et cetera. Um, I'm sure my fellow panelists here would agree that what we're talking about right now is, is not a, a real estate issue. This is a much larger societal challenge that we're dealing with here. Um, and I'm sure they would also agree that, um, unfortunately, much, much like technology, the real estate industry is, is probably decades behind relative to, to other industries. Um, I've been lucky, like many of the panelists, to uh, have come from other companies early in my career, like General Electric and private equity firm TPG, that you know have been focused on inclusion and belonging for decades. And I'm sure if a representative of either of those firms were on this call, they would tell you they're by no means done working on it, um, despite being focused on it for decades. 
But I do know, having been there, that both those firms believe firmly uh, in what's been proven in countless studies, which is diversity and inclusion, um, and I'll throw in equity, and we'll come to that in a second, simply create better outcomes. And that's better employee outcomes, it's better client outcomes. And I think what many of us fail to recognize, um, but it's been proven in the data over and over again, better economic outcomes. And so in commercial real estate, we're, we're too far behind in coming to this realization um, and we need to do something about it. Uh, coming back to being better than just diversity and inclusion and, and getting to equity, I think we need to bring this into the conversation in this industry um, and, and talk about what's equity, what's equality, how do we think about this? Um, there is a nuance there and a, a senior leader in our firm in an effort to continue to educate the executive team uh, over the last you know month with with George Floyd and, and the the various events that have occurred, uh, used a great analogy the other day on the difference between equity and quality, and said you know equality is making sure everybody has a pair of sneakers or a pair of shoes, and equity is making sure everybody has a pair of shoes that fit. And so I, I thought that was a pretty simple and, and powerful analogy that we can all kind of wrap our heads around and. Um, personally, Ingrid, I, I believe the participants in this space and in really any industry that have the courage to go at this and go at this really hard and uh, sustain it this time around um, are the ones that are going to win, um, more broadly speaking. Thank you so much, Bill. So, Scott, kind of to follow up on that, um, what organizational goals does Colliers have post-COVID? Um, around the organization and, and employees. Yeah, thanks, Ingrid, and uh, thanks for those comments, Bill, uh, spot on. So, uh, and that, that, again, another good segue. So, um, you know, for us, we, we our, our goals have always been around differentiating through culture. We call it enterprising, provocative, eliminating red tape. But the word I would use here is, is uh, diversity amongst all those other goals. And I'll explain what I mean by that beyond what people would think when hearing that word. Uh, so we we always have a goal around our people uh, as part of our business plan every year and long term business plan and, you know, attracting, retaining the best talent that um, that aligns with that culture that I just mentioned. So uh, for, for the diversity topic, uh, the first one, which, again, is not what what people would think, um, uh, I would suggest more bringing in more outside industry talent. So again, as we've all said, our, our industry has suffered from being more old school uh, relative to others. And uh, specifically digging in a little in the transaction advisory part of the industry, uh, it's been even more of a traditional model where, as we all know, you have to pay your dues, come in, wait in line, um, maybe even be a, a part of a, um, uh, a structure, uh, an, an old school structure uh, where there's, um, you know, junior and mid-level and senior brokers on a team or whatever. And uh, I, th I think we've all seen that 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 model has forced some of some talented, very talented people to move on to other industries because they wanted to make a meaningful impact. They didn't want to be stifled by the tradition. And uh, I think we have a real opportunity to uh, to bring in uh, bring in great talent from outside the industry, and uh, really be able to have our clients and us benefit uh, put put them in roles where they can really make a difference. So not just in in entry level roles, put them in roles where they can really make a difference. And some of our panelists have even uh, been actually experienced the success of that. So it's great to see. But I think we can do so much more across our industry here, and so you know, these th this talent I think can really make it make a difference, bring us different approaches, continue to 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 push us into areas that we wouldn't normally think about. So really challenging the status quo, and and of course we think clients will, will value this greatly as well. Uh, the second point on diversity is is what uh, several have already mentioned. So thank you for. For raising that, it's it's uh, obviously so topical uh, today more than ever. But um, it's even specific to our organization, a goal uh, we're really trying to hone in. Uh, you know, especially based on the current events, we're really trying to hone in going forward on racial diversity. 
And so um, we, we just really are excited about the momentum across our industry, not even just within our company, but across the industry. We, we think now is the time when it's really going to um, it's, it's going to be it's make a meaningful impact and also be a sustainable change. So uh, we're really excited about leaning in on that uh, part of our goal going forward. Thanks so much, Scott. Chandra, can you talk a little bit about um, potentially one technology investment that you guys have developed during COVID or that was developed during COVID that you anticipate uh, to remain after a vaccine or as the pandemic slows down? Sure. Um, actually, it builds on something Sanjay was talking about. You know, one thing we do at CBRE is um, look at what's emerging in terms of potential needs and trends uh, technologically. So about three years ago, we realized that our clients are starting to really focus on real estate, not just as a physical space, but really wanting to, you know, in the war for talent, provide much better experiences for their employees. And uh, so we actually doubled down and developed a proprietary platform, a, a employee experience platform, or, uh, you know, we refer to it sometimes as a tenant experience platform called Host, uh, which really provides seamless workplace experience from the time you walk into a building access management, booking a conference room, finding a colleague or um, ordering uh, food, if you will. So this platform actually that we already had focused on employee experience has been nicely able to pivot to support the new normal. So what do I mean by that? For example, um, with our host platform today, we can provide personalized recommendations to an employee based on their schedule for the day and who, what their role is. So for example, can I go into the office today? Is my office open? And um, what is the state of the building? And uh, what are the occupancy conditions? Can I book a space You know, with uh, social distancing? Um, are there spaces available? So things that make it very real for employees in today's environment. It also, once you're in the workplace, it helps employees get several cues to ensure that they feel comfortable in the workplace because all of us are worried about, am I gonna be safe? So it's everything from, you know, are there hot spots in the building? Are there, uh, what's the last cleaning schedule in a particular location, et cetera. So they can also report different concerns. So I actually think it's, you know, we didn't plan it this way, but what we started off with, you know, really focusing on an emerging trend in employee experience, Host has been able to pivot very quickly because of the way we built it as a plug and play capability. So we can add new functionality in a plug and play manner. And of course, not to minimize the video conferencing technology that we've all gotten used to, Zoom will definitely stay in place even uh, post um, COVID. And uh, I also want to make a comment on inclusion and belonging. Um, one of the things, you know, clearly by I check at least a couple of boxes on diversity. Um, and when I joined CBRE, what struck me was um, just in, you know, as a company, we've been intensely focused on inclusion and diversity. We have a very diverse board and we have a very diverse executive committee. And um, you know, uh, this environment we live in, I think it's very obvious that people perform at their best when they are happy and confident in who they are. It's like when you walk into a party and you know you belong, you're just gonna have more fun. And so I think companies that truly not don't just talk about it, but embed inclusion and belonging in the way they work and in the culture are definitely going to have uh, much more success in the future than those that don't. Great points, thank you, Chandra. Sanjay, can you talk a little bit about your thoughts on technology advancement and what it's gonna say post, post COVID? Yeah, Ingrid, I think Chandra made some really good uh, uh, points. I mean, the promise of technology and digital transformation is amazing. But you know, if I could uh, just go back for just for a second, and it's so heartening to hear the passion in Bill's voice and Scott's voice and Chandra's around this idea of uh, inclusion, diversity, equity, there's so much more we have to do. I mean, none of us is happy with where we are, and we are privileged uh, to be, you know, in positions we are. And listen, if a year from now, three years from now, we look back, and we as an industry haven't made just amazing um, progress on this, we should look in the mirror uh, because we know who to blame. Uh, you know, if all of us together are of like mind, we can really move the needle. Uh, but sorry, a little bit of passion coming out there. But uh, <clears throat> going back to technology. So um, Chandra mentioned this in our opening remarks as well. Uh, you know, I, I think this promise of technology, there were technologies that were emerging 
they were somewhat nascent pre-COVID. Uh, and they weren't a priority or not as much of a priority. And that's why the take-up rates were low. Those are all getting accelerated. I mean, this domain of real estate, facilities, management, workplace experience, whatever we want to call it, it is elevated like never before. The relevance, the value is undebatable. It's uh, at the C-suite and it will attract and is attracting attention and investments and applications and data, et cetera. And we're all doing it. We're all doing our part. I mean, Chandra mentioned some of the things you're doing. Uh, we actually brought together um, into JLL Technologies our uh, Spark Investment uh, Fund, our products that we're de uh, developing, um, this whole idea of build by partner, our partnerships, because what we do internally with technology and what we do with our clients <clears throat> is all blending together now. Um, and, and what I see is, um, is there one particular advancement? I would say there are so many advancements that are getting accelerated and maybe even, maybe even repurposed. Uh, so let's just take space management just as one example. So pre-COVID, the answer, the question that we were trying to answer with space management systems was, how do I allocate space efficiently? Now the same space management systems are repurposed towards compliance tracking and social distancing. Things like wearables are accelerating. So it's really exciting to see some of these get repurposed, accelerated, connected buildings, resilient buildings, air quality, predictive maintenance. I mean, the list goes on. Uh, things that we've been talking about and this group on the webinar, those of us that are speaking and those of, of you that are listening, we've all been passionate about it but the good news is it's getting accelerated and I think it's gonna get investments. And data, um, uh, going back to the topic of data, really data provided through digital behaviors, uh, anticipating needs for employees and businesses alike, all of these things are just getting accelerated. So uh, we may look back a few years from now and I don't know if we'll thank COVID for it, but we will definitely give it uh, due uh, for accelerating these technologies. Great, thanks, Sanjay. Um, so as we think about coming to a close of this session, I think it would be really great um, for our participants to be able to hear a little advice from the panel. So Bill, starting with you, is there any career advice that you would like to share with the next generation of CER or FM leaders um, who may be listening today? Yeah, sure. Thanks for the question, Ingrid. And I'm curious to hear the rest of the panel as well, because I know we get this, we all get this question quite a bit. I would say over the years, my answers probably haven't changed that much. They, they've maybe evolved, but um, I probably have a little more conviction as, as the years go by. Uh, so a few things for me. Um, and this sounded incredibly strange to me when I first heard it in my early 20s, um, thinking, you know, I was trying to map what's the right job and how do I climb the ladder? Um, pick something that you're going to have fun with. And if you're enjoying your work, and I think we talked about this in the context of uh, inclusion, but if you're enjoying your work, you're going to be successful. If, if you're going to work because you're picking the right job and you think you should be doing it and you, you can't be your authentic self for whatever reason, it's gonna be a lot harder. You're gonna have a lot of internal conflict. So I, I think try to have something that's fun. Uh, the second thing is, is again, around diversity. And I, uh, I'm biased because of how I grew up coming up through GE, who had a philosophy of moving folks uh, quite frequently into different industries, different geographies. But um, I've heard others say in, in this industry, go deep, go broad, go deep, go broad again. Um, but I, I do firmly believe that the best leaders have a, a very diverse set of experiences to draw upon. Uh, and finally, uh, this is uh, personal for me, but keep things simple. Um, I have three things that I use as my guiding principles, and it, it starts with integrity and then value and people. Uh, I think if you're always using integrity as, as your North Star and trying to do the right thing, uh, couple that with creating value and um, really thinking about what what in the conversation is creating value for your client, for another stakeholder, an employee, a shareholder, et cetera. Um, and then you're surrounding yourself with the best people, whether that's you know picking the right boss or, or being on a great team or hiring the best talent. Um, I think you'll get to the best outcomes. Great. Thanks so much, Bill. Great advice. 
for all of us, not probably just the next generation. Um, Chandra, I'd love to hear your thoughts as well. Sure, and great. By the way, um, I'm also monitoring the chat room here. And um, you know, one of the comments was we're talking about technology and not uh, just IT. Anytime I talk about technology, it's a combination of OT and IT, and you will see increasing convergence. So you're not just talking about IT. And somebody had a question on what the experience platform is called. It's called Host. Um, so you can Google, uh, if you go to cbre.com, you can see that. In terms of career advice, you know, the way I think about it, the entire world has gone through a reset. And uh, that's the word that I would use. And history shows that big changes bring big opportunities. So in the real estate industry, no matter where we came from, I think as we look forward, my um, advice would be, let's be bold in reimagining the future of commercial real estate and FM and execute on that bold vision. And don't be afraid to lean in on technology as an enabler. And uh, the other thing I would say is, whatever industry you're in, whatever role you're in, Technology is going to just become embedded in the things that we do. So position yourself to become tech savvy enough to be able to reimagine what's possible so that you will have an, if you do that, I think you'll have an edge over um, others that don't do that. And um, so be bold, reimagine, and embrace tech to be enough of a tech savvy leader. And I think various paths uh, open up for you in saying that I'm sure I'm biased um, to pitch tech here, but uh, I think it's important. Great, thank you so much, Shonda. Colette, um, I think it, we have about 10 minutes left. I don't know if we wanna open up for some questions from the audience. Uh, we do. So thank you. That was that was an uh, amazing panel and some real thought leadership and advice for the industry. So thank you all. Um, and we do have a few questions and a few themes coming from the chat room. One of those is maybe for each one of the panelists. If you could name one thing that you're optimistic about regarding the future of the FM industry. Who would you like to start? <clears throat> when are we, uh, we can go in order. Actually, start with Scott. Um, Sure. Thanks, Colette. So I, I would say the one thing would be the um, demand for our the services we're all offering in our industry. I think our uh, the the future is as bright as it's ever been for our industry, and it's it's maybe contrary to what people are thinking right now. I know all of us have probably run into people you've met for the first time over the past couple months and they ask, what do you do? And you say you're in the commercial real estate business and they go, oh, I'm sorry, that's so, what are you gonna do? And I, I we just, uh, I, I think there's more more and more opportunity now and in, in different ways in many cases as we've all talked about. So that, that would be my one comment. Terrific. Chandra, how about you? You know, I would say two things, one, um, as I mentioned earlier, this is a reset. And therefore, as you look ahead, there are two things that give me a um, lot of encouragement. One, this whole thing about uh, human resilience that Sanjay touched upon and uh, the concept of employee well-being and wellness and safety experiences at work is going to be so much more prevalent. There were some leading edge companies that are starting to focus on it. I think every company will focus on it uh, and it's good for the people. Uh, are all our employees. The second thing is, you know, we've all learned to do things virtually more so than before. So hopefully we don't have to drive as much and this concept of contributing to better sustainable future is also something that we can contribute to as an industry. So those are the two things that give me a lot of optimism other than, you know, big change always brings big opportunities. Sanjay, how about you? Yeah, I think I'm just building on uh, Scott and Chandra's comments. I mean, I just uh, I just think there's so many emerging dimensions to this industry. We talked about sustainability. Um, you know, we talked about things like resiliency, uh, technology, of course. Uh, health wellness was really a nice to have for the longest time. And now mental health, physical health, wellness, financial well-being, all of these, again, going back to the topic of experience, side of facilities management real estate can play a tremendous role and i was just as i was listening i was reflecting back to sort of a bit of my past and uh you know look at banking as an example of consumer banking the promise of digitization for this industry is unprecedented that's why i think i'm really excited and optimistic 
think back to 2010, 20, 2009, after the financial crisis is when consumer banking or retail for that example, really started their journey um, down the path of digitization uh, or digitally transforming the core of what they did. And short five years later, look back to think back to 2015, 16, you know, mobile deposits, I mean, the list goes on. Uh, so we are about there. We are where consumer banking was maybe not 2010, but maybe 2011, 12, the next five years, this will be a completely different industry. So, I mean, it's very exciting, very optimistic about the industry. Great, thank you. Bill, how about you? Well, it's always hard to go last um, in a question like that, right? So I, I agree with what all the, the panelists have said. Maybe maybe I'll try a wrapper uh, for, for the comments. I, I think it's uh, probably the most exciting time to be a participant in, in this industry because what, what we're seeing is massive acceleration of some of the trends that were transforming the industry already. And when you when you come into an event like this, you try to pick what are what are the things that are going to continue to accelerate at, at a more rapid pace and, and what are the macro trends that maybe go away. Um, I think in our industry we're going to see a massive acceleration of, of a lot of the trends that the other panelists have been talking about. So really exciting times. Great. So thank you, thank you for answering that. I, I just, in the interest of time, want to provide each of you an opportunity maybe to share some closing thoughts maybe that we haven't touched upon or you want to you leave with the audience. Um, just some kind of parting, parting uh, thought leadership. So Bill, um, let's start with you since uh, you were last on the last question. All right. Um, I'm going to go back to a word I used earlier uh, in the discussion, which is empathy. Um, <clears throat> I think if, if there's one thing, um, and this isn't applicable just to FM professionals, but I think if there's one thing we've learned in, in this crisis, um, you know, as we've spent time in our homes or have had others maybe more severely impacted by the virus, is probably a greater sense of, of empathy. And I, I just hope that all of us can maintain that sense of empathy and, and maintain the stamina to, to drive the change that we all know is the right thing to do. Sanjay, how about you? Yeah, I think I go back to the excitement, the promise of the industry, and it comes with a lot of responsibility, doesn't it? Um, I mean, I talked about the elevation of this domain, our domain in the C-suite, and it will attract uh, investments. Um, but, uh, you know, for all of us that are in this industry, there's so much learning and reinventing ourselves and, and this industry and individually ourselves and trying out and, and uh, sort of getting into new spaces, all these different dimensions I talked about earlier is the promise and is the opportunity. So um, future is bright. Chandra, how about you? You know, I come back to what we started this um, uh, panel with, the, the question on digital transformation, right? We talk a lot about technology and we're going through a tremendous amount of change and challenging times around the world. And uh, for me, it's about coming back to what it means um, as people in our industry. And, you know, we have uh, four leading firms represented on this call. We compete hard with each other on a day-to-day -day basis, but there's so much we can do together as an industry to really focus on what I mentioned earlier about you know, uh, wellness and um, uh, experience in the workspaces and sustainability. So there's a lot we can do together. I believe business is a team sport and teams win championships. And so uh, I'm encouraged by the um, uh, you know, uh, folks on this call and what we can do together as an industry going forward. Scott? Yeah, thanks. Thanks again. Uh, all great comments. I, I just say that, you know, the power of collaboration I and mean, for us to be able to come together, all of us to be able to come together and learn from each other. Uh, our, our industry has always faced that challenge with how do how do our clients inside their organizations build that bridge with their internal customers and, and get get a seat at the C-suite like we've always talked about. and you know, this is just a great opportunity for, for our clients to do that and for, for everybody to win as a result. So it's great. Terrific. Well, I want to thank each of you. I know you're extremely busy, but really appreciate you taking the time to share your knowledge with the FM community. We hope that this has been an informative event for the audience. So please participate in future events. You'll be receiving a survey within the next 24 hours 
please give us your feedback. Um, that will that feedback will help us really shape the future of beta. So we want everybody to have a voice in the future of the built environment and the technology that supports that. So thank you again, everybody. Stay safe and appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.